Good morning. It's good to be with you on this winter day. I'm Hillary Clark, and I'm one of eight worship associates who work with our interim minister, Reverend Susan Suchaki Brown, our director of Life Day and Ministries, Kirsten Hunter, our musicians and staff to create worship services for you each week. With me today is Joanne Conley, our director of music ministry. Joanne, would you like to tell us about the music you have in store for us today? Yes, Hillary, thank you. It's so nice to be with you all here this morning, right after the Christmas holiday. And what a great time to look back at this year in music. We're going to be supporting the worship associates in their special service about storm clouds and silver linings. Our music will be about the challenges and the unexpected gifts of this year. Thank you, South Church folk, for participating, and Susan Adams and I as well will be sharing music. Thank you. What else, Hillary? Well, I just wanted to let people know that if you attend services regularly, welcome. And if you're tuning in for the first time, a special welcome to you. After the service, there will be a virtual coffee hour. And the link for that is on the email that you received last night or this morning, or you can find it on the members page or the friends Facebook page. Reverend Susan is usually in the pulpit twice a month, and on other Sundays, we hear from Kirsten or guest speakers from without, within and without our congregation. Today's special end of the year service, as Joanne mentioned, is brought to you by all the worship associates. And I encourage everyone to make sure you watch to the very end so that you see the credits after the service. Have a good morning. Each month, half of our offertory collection is shared with a nonprofit organization doing good work in our community. This year, because of COVID, our shared plate process of nominating and voting will be done totally online. During the month of January, the congregation nominates organizations. So please nominate any organizations you would like us to consider. Then in February, we'll be voting on our choices. Forms will be available on the South Church website and we'll send you reminders via email. 
The South Church Spiritual Book Group is hosting film discussions in January and February. We will discuss The Reader, starring Kate Winslet and Rafe Fiennes, on Wednesday, January 13, at 7 p.m. Please watch the film in advance of the discussion. All are welcome. Contact South Church Book Group at gmail.com for the Zoom link. We wish you all good things for a happy year ahead. All good things for a happy year ahead. We wish you all good things for a happy year ahead. All good things for a happy year ahead. We wish you joy. We wish you health. We wish you love. We wish you peace. We wish you joy. We wish you health. We wish you love. We wish you peace. We wish you all good things for a happy year ahead. All good things for a happy year ahead. We wish you all good things for a happy year ahead. All good things for a happy year ahead. Happy New Year. For many of us, this turning of the year is a time of quiet reflection. The days are only just beginning to lengthen the dark still dominates our waking hours. The busyness that filled our recent days is over. The house is tidied, the decorations boxed and put away, leftovers finished. Our thoughts turn inward. We begin to take stock of where we are and perhaps who we are. So here we are at the end of 2020. Wow. Who could have imagined how our awareness of the world would change this year? Each of us has had our life affected in profound ways. Each of us has had our life affected in unique ways. For many, perhaps most, there has been severe hardship. For some, hopefully most, there have been unexpected joys. As the worship associates were planning for this service, we decided to do something different. We wanted to share with each of you and, and with each other, how we experienced this year. For those of you who listen to Maine Public on Friday mornings, you'll be familiar with a segment called StoryCorps, where one person interviews another about a particular subject. We decided to use this format to share our stories. We crafted interview questions that we thought addressed some of the unique experiences of 2020. Those interviews will be coming up later in the service. Throughout all the twists and turns of this year, South Church community and staff have adapted and responded. Sunday services found ways to be engaging and inventive, my favorite being the story for all ages. Coffee hours and social hours provided opportunities to connect. Salvation Army Soup Kitchen and Seacoast Family Promise continued to offer sustenance to area residents. Adult programming expanded and youth program, programming offered virtual and in-person opportunities. All the associate programs continued to educate, entertain, and provide comfort. I want to thank you all for your continued presence, your dedication to our community, your love, and your continued faith. As I light this chalice, I invite you at home to light your chalice, to add to the light and love that we put out into the world. And I light the chalice today with these words from the Reverend Scott Taylor. When our days turn cold and the light dims, may we take hold of the hands reaching out and let them lead us to the comforting flame. When repression and indignity rise, may we kindle the lamp of justice together. When exhaustion seeps into our bones, may we let the soft light lead us to rest. And when joy sneaks in and surprises us with grace, May we stop for just one second and celebrate. 
Now, please join me in reciting our mission statement, which will appear on your screen. At South Church, we nurture spiritual growth through worship, learning, and community. We celebrate the worth and dignity of all people, and we inspire one another to act on our faith in the larger community. Happy solstice to you all. I'm here by my fire. So the story I'm going to tell you is the story of Guscabe in the game bag. It's a story that I learned from Wolf Song and Abenaki storyteller that I met growing up outside of Burlington, Vermont. And I'm reminded of this story because tonight's the night of the solstice. It's the longest night of the year and also because it reminds me of what we're going through in this time. One day Guscabe he goes out into the forest and he decides to go hunting and as he went out and he went across through the forests and into the fields where he planned to hunt he wasn't being quite too quiet. He was a little too confident in his abilities and the animals they heard him coming and in these old times the animals could talk to one another and then they let each other know that Gustave was coming so they went off into their dens and their holes and the owl went up into its burrow in the tree and Gustave could not find any of the animals to hunt he got frustrated because he was hungry he went back home where he lives with Grandmother Woodchuck. And Grandmother Woodchuck, she'd laid a stick over the door of their lodge to show that she was busy, but Kluskabe paid no mind. He just marched right on in. And he said, Grandmother, Grandmother, oh, the hunting is no good. You know, Grandmother, I would like you to make me a game bag. Grandmother said, okay, 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 I can do that, grandson. Yes, let's see. And so she went out into the forest, and the animals were still hiding. She was able to find the fur of the deer, where it got hung up on the trees or in the grasses. And she gathered a whole bunch of it up. She rolled it and wove it together to make a fine game bag. She said, here, Guscabe, here. Here you can keep your game when you go hunting. And he looked at the bag and said, oh, thank you, grandmother. Oleone. 
but this isn't quite what I had in mind. And he set it on the ground. And he said, okay, and you make me something a bit, a bit more. Grandmother said, oh, okay, grandson, okay. And she went out again. And she had to stretch up to reach it from the trees higher up. Or crawl down by the water and pluck it from the cattails. But she gathered up enough moose fur to make a great big game bag. This was a very fine bag. And she said, here, Gluskabe, surely this could hold whatever you can hunt. Ah, thank you, grandmother. This is, this is nice, but no. And he threw it on the floor. This is not, this is not what I'm after. My grandmother was getting a bit frustrated, but she thought, okay, okay, maybe he needs something more special. So she went out again, and she gathered up the furs of the otter and the beaver from down by the water to give the bag waterproofing. And she found some quills from the porcupine and wove those in to give it decoration. This was not as large as the moose bag, but it was very, very beautiful. Here, Gluskabe. Surely this will meet your needs. So, oh, grandmother, this is very fine. This is very beautiful. Clearly you've done very well with this. But no, this is not what I want. It's a grandson. What can you be after? Well, I have something very special in mind, grandmother. Grandmother says, okay, okay, grandson. She thought maybe she knew what he meant. She knew she would have to put some of herself into this bag. So she went to a corner of the lodge and she began to pull and pluck the fur from her stomach and gather more and more until the time that her stomach became bald. And that is why the stomachs of the woodchucks are naked to this day. And she wove her own fur into a game bag, giving it the strength and the beauty and the quality of herself. Now this wasn't as large or as beautiful, but it had her gifts woven into it. And she said, here, Guskabe, how about this? Said, ah, yes, thank you, grandmother. This is what I had in mind. And he went out again to the forest and the fields to find the animals to go hunting. And they heard him, and he could tell that they did and were going to run away. He said, wait, wait, don't go. My friends, I come to you with a message. You see, I've learned the sun, the sun, it is tired. And it wants to rest and it's going to get dark and the world will get cold and you will get hungry. But here, here, I can keep you warm. Here, climb into my bag. And they were a little skeptical, but Mouse was kind of cold already. And Mouse climbed in and then Chipmunk, and Raccoon, and Deer and Moose and the bag having grandmother's special powers just grew and grew and grew till all the animals were inside. Guskabe said, ha ha, yes. Yes, very good. This is what I'm after. And he came back home to the lodge with grandmother. He said, grandmother, we will never have to hunt again. Oh, it's so wonderful. Look, look, all the animals are in here. Whenever we get hungry, we can just pull one out and we can eat. Mm. Grandmother, oh, she's like, Guskabe, Guskabe, what have you done? Guskabe, the animals in your bag, how will they eat? How will stay they big? How will they stay big and round and plump to feed you? There will not be enough for you to eat over time. They will get weak, and they will not sustain you. Skabe thought, hmm, hmm, yes, grandmother, I guess, I guess this is so. All right, I, I will make this right. So, he 
He took the game bag back to the forest, into the fields where he'd gathered all the animals up, and he had an idea. He said, aha, here. And he opened up the bag just as the sun was coming up. He said, animals, yes, it was scary. The sun, it went out. But I convinced it to come back. See, see, it rises. You're safe. I took care of you. You can go back about your ways. And the animal says, oh, thank you, Gluskabe. Thank you for taking care of us. And they went back to their forests and their dens and their holes. And Gluskabe taught the people the ways of how to take what they needed, but not too much, so that the next time they go hunting, the animals are still well fed and there is enough to feed their children and their great-grandchildren and the next seven generations. I was reminded of the story because like the animals, I think soon, soon we'll get to come out and greet the dawn again. So may it be. Olione, thank you for listening. How fortuitous that the Worship Associates are bringing you this service today at the end of 2020, and that I am tasked with asking for this morning's offering. We are sharing our collection today with the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire, an organization that seeks to defend the Constitution of the United States with the goal of creating a more perfect union. The other half of our offering will support the good work of South Church, which is both a lot of work and which does cost money. In a few moments, directions on how to make a contribution will appear on your screen. But first, as you likely know by now, I am also the chair of this year's budget campaign, tasked with raising $515,000 to meet our operational expenses in the new year, the year that is not 2020. As of right now, we have raised approximately $459,000. Take a look at this latest photo of our ABC bulletin board while I'll share just a little bit about where we are. Right now, we're at almost 90% of our goal. And that's great, really. We have 245 pledges in the door, many of which are a substantial increase over last year, and we are truly grateful. It's also not enough. You see what's left in our columns? N-I-T-Y, nitty, without spell check, as in the nitty gritty, and that's what we're down to. We didn't ask for $515,000 to have a nice cushy budget with lots of wiggle room. We asked for what we knew would be required just to keep our buildings running, service the debt on the mortgage necessary to pay the contractors for replacing the roof, and pay our staff, including a potential new minister's salary and benefits sometime into the next year. $56,000. That is what we still need. Now, if the 60 or so members of South Church who didn't pledge at all last year or the year before that would each commit to $20 a week, we'd be there, but that's unlikely. So what are the rest of us going to do about this shortfall? What will our candidates for settled minister think if we fail to meet our pledge goal? What or whom shall we not pay? in 2021. We're going to come back to you, you who have been so generous, so responsive in this extraordinary year, and we're going to ask you to do a little bit more. Look out for a postcard from the ABC in your mail this week and an email in your inbox. Think about whether and how you can come up with an extra five dollars a week, or maybe ten. I'm pretty sure I can. And can your partner also? Can your children participate and figure out that they could give $2 a week to this church, our place of deep connection, our beautiful historic spiritual home, this bright beacon for religious liberalism on the seacoast? Do I believe that we can reach our goal if each of us does just a little bit more? Absolutely. Do I think we will? 
that's up to us. Thank you. darkest days of the year have passed, and as our planet completes another circuit around our sun, we look forward to the return of light, marking a brighter future. The new year is a new chance, a new beginning, a point in time to anchor our strength and our will to change our lives and the world around us. Let us pray for the strength, energy, and will to make the changes we envision. In a way, the changes have already begun. So let us pray for our newly elected members of government to work with wisdom and compassion for the greater good. Let us pray for a more fair and more just world in the new year and for the will and strength to help make it so. And finally, let us pray for the day that we can all be together again in warmth and kindness. Blessings on all for the new year.
And now for the Worship Associates interviews that Hillary outlined in her opening words. We divided the eight associates into two panels of four with a hymn in between. The first pa panel will include Myra Aronson, who recruits our guest speakers and dubbed us to be today's guest, Laurie Bilby, who had Myra's job last year, and myself, Bob Vaccaro. Rather than a biography to introduce us, we agreed to share something about us that you don't already know and that you might only learn at our memorial service if you happen to outlive us. I'll start with Myra. While growing up in heavily Jewish Queens public housing, Myra aspired to become an, a cowgirl who could gallop over rolling hills. In her 20s, most of her discretionary spending went for horseback riding lessons. By the time she turned 30, Myra was accomplished enough to volunteer for a week at a Wyoming cattle ranch. That week is still a highlight of her life, riding every day with the ranch cowboys as they herded wild horses and cattle, including a two-day trip taking a herd of wild horses from their summer range to their winter range. Think the movie City Slickers. And the highlight of that two-day trip was galloping at full speed through a canyon with dust flying everywhere and the roar of pounding hoofs, the recall of which still makes her smile with ecstatic joy. Now for Lori. When she and Fenn lived in Dorchester, Massachusetts, they loved to bowl, real bowling with 10 pins and big balls in an LGBT league. After moving to Kittery Point, the late night long drive on Wednesdays got too much, given her full-time job in Boston. To fill the gap and to get to know some locals, Laurie thought to check out the Kittery Adult Education course catalog and stumbled onto a course in beginning Italian. A dozen or so years later, that ongoing interest has led to good friendships, travel to Europe, better cooking skills, and watercolor painting. Laurie's Aunt Bunny was right when she told Laurie's generation at a family dinner to never miss an opportunity. And for me, in college, I majored in electrical engineering and studied Italian and in graduate school, I had a dual major, one of which was international business. None of this had much relevance to my 27 year gig teaching yoga. However, it did land me two fun jobs in my 20s. One was working for the Central Bank of Nicaragua as a consultant to small businesses wanting to export to the United States. Jackie and I took six weeks to drive to my Managua job site through Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. Halfway there, our new Toyota Corolla lost its ability to go backward. It took several months before we could get the, the right repair part. During this time, we had to park on upward sloping streets and endure the smiles of locals who seldom saw gringos so precariously handicapped. Unfortunately, our colleague Brian Bliss could not participate with us. A rarity among us, Brian grew up in the seacoast, York, Maine to be exact, and lives with his family in Kittery. A life-changing experience for Brian was the year he worked in the world-renowned Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. He loves playing guitar and is passionate about teaching mindfulness and stress reduction. But it's his wife, Kaliana, and their two daughters, ages four and eight, who have the strongest hold on his heart. We'll begin the interviews of our, of our panelists with this question from Myra Aronson. This was a hard year for many of us, Myra. Can you tell me about one of the most difficult things for you this year? And what about some of the good experiences that came from this year? Thanks, Bob. Um, I think it's important that we remember both the storm clouds and the silver linings for this year. Um, and so I'm not ready to say just good riddance to 2020, um, but there were some things that were significantly um, difficult and sad in 2020. And for me, one of those, uh, the most significant was worrying about the isolation of my mom in Florida. She's 97 and she's lived independently since my dad died um, two years ago. And she's in really good shape, but she's really lonely and she's never learned how to drive. So she's pretty much housebound. And that's been a concern for me and my siblings. Of the three of us, um, I'm the closest one and I'm in New Hampshire and, and our mom's in Florida. So it, it's been hard. She does have an aide who comes in for a few hours a week, but it really hasn't been enough. Um, we are grateful though. We had tried to convince her to move into assisted living after my dad died. And now we're glad that didn't happen because those people are getting ill 
and she's been so isolated that she's managed to stay safe um, and healthy. So that's been good. And last month, my sister moved and her husband moved to Florida to be closer to my mother, which is a great relief for my brother and, and me. But it's still, we're still really concerned about her. She'll be, she's almost 98. Um, so that's been hard this year. On the other side, um, on the silver lining side, I have seen a lot more of my friends and family this year than I normally would, thanks to the wonders of Zoom. So every single Friday since April, there's a transcontinental Aronson family categories game on Zoom, which is just a riot. I mean, we play only for creativity and giggles. We don't keep score. And it doesn't matter whether your answer makes any sense or is even possible except in sci-fi. Um, and it's just been wonderful. So I have cousins that in the previous life, um, I might talk to once or maybe twice a year and not see for years on end. And now I see them and speak to them and connect to them every single week. And we just have such a great time. Um, so, and it's a highlight of the week for my mom. She actually learned how to do Zoom so that she can play with us. It's just great. Um, and other friends who I haven't seen in years, old friends I've gotten back in touch with thinking, you know, I don't know if these people are still alive with this pandemic. And that's been wonderful through letters and phone calls. So I think that's been a really wonderful thing for me um, that's come out of this year. On the other hand, I've noticed that in some cases, the connections between individuals, families, and friends have been strained and have morphed as the pandemic played out. Um, Lori, what was this like for you? And did you ever feel lonely and disconnected? And how did you deal with that? Thanks for asking that, Myra. I think it is important that we acknowledge uh, that 2020 was not easy. It definitely presented challenges. Um, for me, I think it was difficult to be so reliant on electronic communication. I mean, I so much appreciate having Zoom and uh, you know other web platforms and internet and email and the phone, but I think you know, particularly when we're sort of under strain and a little tired and a little anxious and a little depressed anyway, that it's really easy to misinterpret electronic communications when you don't have that, all that immediate body language and inflection, you know, all that sort of feedback that, that smooth communication. And I think misinterpretation uh, happens or has happened more than I, uh, I would like it to both you know, as sender and, and receiver. So that's not, that's not been ideal. Um, and I think one of the reasons, one of the ways that I've tried to handle that is to really rely on sort of the tried and true relationships in my life. The ones, the ones that are long pre-COVID that have, you know, been tested, that have withstood uh, and to know that everything is gonna be okay. You know, that, that, that little blips are not going to rupture, you know, these sort of solid relationships. And one of the other things that I've really tried to do is, is to try to find ways to do in-person um, time with family and friends. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not that unusual for me to call up one of two or three friends who have backyard fire pits and say, hey, it's a balmy 42 degrees this evening. How about we bundle up and, and have a safe distance uh, uh, fire pit and just be able to look at each other and talk at the same time. So that has been, uh, that's been super helpful in that regard. So I, I am really deeply grateful for those established um, re reliable relationships where we can support each other uh, through the dark times. So Bob, looking back on this year, what do you find, what are the things that you have found yourself to be most grateful for? Yeah, thanks for um, allowing me with that, that question because I, I think I practice um, gratefulness as a, as a, as a to counter my anxiety. <laughs> so the, the, the first thing was, is health. You know, I, um, I, it made me appreciate, the pandemic made me appreciate my good health even more. I've always been a health nut, but this past uh, the, the February before the pandemic started, Dan and I went to Costa Rica and sipped water for 21 days and uh, refed on organic fruits and tender leafy greens and came back feeling pretty, pretty uh, strong immune system. So I, for someone my age, I didn't have the fear that a lot of people my age, um, you know, deservedly had about, about the pandemic. Uh, secondly, I was able to stop teaching yoga without any guilt. I probably for a couple of years I should have stopped teaching and, uh, and um, I just didn't want to tell my students. So this was, it was easy to tell them. And uh, the third thing I was thankful about was that my work is, is considered essential work. I, I'm 
my paying job is a manager of a potential community house in Portsmouth, and that job continues. So I was thankful for that. And um, the fourth thing is I was I had time. We, Dan and I had time for a major move. We've been living apart for ten years, and um, after the um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Dan found a house that we could we could uh, both fit in and and yet uh, small enough that we could uh, afford it. And and that took uh, so much time that I was glad not to have to do social things at the same time. You know, between finding a mortgage and and um, and consolidating three apartments into one and renovations, et cetera. And um, the fifth thing was the, um, I, I, I learned during the pandemic that I actually um, have an introvert side of me and that, and I got to uh, notice that and, and actually like that part. And that made Dan and I more harmonious. So that was sweet. And uh, finally, um, thanks to the pandemic, my, uh, our granddaughters had got more time with their dad. So my son-in-law uh, up to the pandemic was working 80 hours a week, which meant he was only home to sleep. And uh, my daughter felt like a single mom most of the time. And thanks to the pandemic, he had to stay home and he, he loved it. And uh, I think he values that a little more than his job now and has figured out a way to have more time with his family. So that's, that's, that's the good news. That's my stories. Thank you. Love will guide us, peace has tried us, hope inside us will lead the way on the road from greed to giving. Love will guide us through the hard night if you cannot sing like a Our second panel consists of Jonathan Cummings, our Worship Associates convener, Arthur Eaves, Rhett Newberry, and Hillary Clark. I'll start with Jonathan. Now at age 38, Jonathan has played soccer for some 33 years, since he was five. Growing up in a small Vermont town, he played soccer every fall in his elementary school and helped his team with, win their league championship. In high school, Jonathan says he was one of the nerdy players because he was also a strong student. Disappointingly, his team came in second place in the Vermont State Championships. At Oberlin College, Jonathan shifted to playing on their intramural teams, which he organized as part of his work study program. In grad school in Vancouver, he played in an Eastern European league. The list goes on. These days, Jonathan plays in the Over the Hill Soccer League out of Boston, a league that can, can include guys into their 60s. So not for me. Now for Arthur. For 25 years, Arthur rode the electronic wave as the graphics director of Business Week, shepherding this oracle of might into the age of the internet. At age 60, he gave up the stress of his big corporate job to retrain to teach high school science. After a couple of teaching missteps, Arthur found his niche at an urban charter school where he and a colleague created their own curriculum and taught all the sciences at once. As a summer director of the Marine Lab at Star Island, Arthur brought his New Jersey students to the island the first week of June, happily combining his loves for science, Star Island, and inspiring our youth. Hillary, while many of us learn to go to some places warm and sunny during our long winters, Hillary loves to head north. For several years now, she has volunteered for a week at the top of Mount Washington where the winds can reach 110 miles per hour and the temperatures can plummet to 28 degrees below zero. And it's not that Hilly likes to be cold. She just loves bad weather and ice and dresses for it. That being said, her favorite picture of herself was taken on her 60th birthday 
jumping into the Antarctic Ocean in her swimsuit. Brett. Brett has a long family history with a small island three miles off the coast of Maine called Squirrel Island. Consisting of 106 summer houses, a non-denominational church, and no cars, this island served as the summer home for generations of Mayflower families when the mothers and mother and kids would re relocate there, there all summer and the father would visit around his work schedule. Both of Brett's parents were from such families, met there and married there. Even after they divorced, his parents maintained residences on the island. During high school and college, Brett lived with his dad there during the summer, running the island delivery service, and visited his mom there during Thanksgiving and Christmas breaks while she was the island's winter caretaker. On New Year's Eve, they would ring the church bells just for them and his mom's guests to hear. Now for Jonathan to start the panel discussions. I feel like this year is fuller than most. Like everything kind of piled on top of each other. There's the divisiveness of our politics in the country that's not new, but I feel like it was a lot stronger this year. Our president was impeached and acquitted. An anti-abortion conservative was added to the Supreme Court. Partisanship prevented funding relief from the pandemic. There were ongoing protests calling for justice. Presidential election that took a week sealed conclusive results and spiraled into seditious lawsuits. And some even called for secession. Pandemic made risk tolerance in politics with everyone visible from a plant stressed our connections and moral relationships with family and friends. Seems like 2020 amplified the effects of our individual decisions on our collective well-being and the quality of our collective institutions were felt by all of us. Arthur, when you look back on this year, are there any moments where you felt proud of the individual and collective decisions of others? Well, First off, I'm very proud of the Republican state election officials and governors who really risked their political futures to stand by their integrity. And I'm also proud of all the Americans who voted. Um, locally in Dover, I'm really proud of the Dream Group, which is a bunch of um, students from Dover High School who organized a Black Lives Matter protest here, not knowing how their community would respond. And um, I'm especially proud of the community of Dover because people came out in force to support them and to support the Black Lives Matter cause. And I'm proud of the people of South Church who in challenging circumstances have stood up and done what needed to be done to hold our church community get together and to care for one another and to serve the wider community. Yeah, and when you think about your day-to-day -day life, did you re-examine or make any changes to the way you do things? And do you anticipate you'll return to any prior ways or continue with some changes moving forward? No, well, because I'm retired, I'm fortunate enough to have not been impacted financially by COVID. Myra and I like to do things together, uh, but we have enough space. We can part, be apart when we need to be. Our daughter has returned to live with us, but that's a real blessing. We all contribute to the household and operations and we like each other and it's good because we haven't seen her for 10 years. But life did really narrow down to its essentials. There was no travel. There was very little socializing outside of our small little core. Uh, what we did was through Zoom. And there was time for lots of reading and gardening. Certainly the future me will be more carbon conscious. I'll think a lot more about flying someplace. And I'll be much more appreciative of the people that I encounter. It's also made me think a lot about investing for the future. Is keeping money in a 401k or investment count better than putting money to work in the community? Brett, 
What wisdom can you pass down, having lived in this time? Well, a piece of wisdom that I would like to pass down and have survived is how interconnected we all are. And the things that you and John have said so far have already alluded to this to some extent. But when you think about, um, you know, how we how we uh, stood up for marginalized communities in this year and how the decisions of the people around us can affect everything about us right down to our health. Um, we really do uh, all affect each other. Every bit of the human society has a, an effect on one another. And it's so important to recognize that. And as we go forward, I want people to continue to remember that you know what that the lowest paid workers out there are the ones that were the most essential for us to get by in this year that the people that are you know that we don't think about on our day-to-day -day lives the person bagging our groceries the person pulling the carts in from outside those people were essential to, to our livelihoods to making our society function and we need to continue to recognize how interconnected we all are and that every one of us is an important part of that web. In the end, it's again, living to our values, honoring and respecting the worth and dignity of all people. So Brett, difficulties can lead to wisdom, but despite the difficulties of this year, often the bitterness of hard times make the good times all the sweeter. Are there any memories you look on with fondness from this year? Well, I'd like to remember the small victories, especially the ones around my family. Teaching my kids how to use computers so that they can use things like Zoom and Skype to stay connected with their friends and do their classwork at the end of the last school year, that was pretty amazing. Watching them learn to do, use that technology, mm -hmm. then watching them grow as we've all spent time together my oldest daughter, Dahlia, choosing to be homeschooled and having to do some testing to make sure we were teaching her the right thing and really discovering in a concrete way just how smart she really is. My next daughter, Rosalie, choosing to go to school at when the opportunity came back in the fall and doing it with gusto. She wanted that connection with her, with her friends. But when the time came that we had to go remote leading into the holidays, she attacked that with gusto as well. She really was a trooper through all of it. And then there's uh, the little one, Simon. With all this time learning from myself and Angela and his sisters, he is growing in so many ways. Watching him learn to express himself has been one of the greatest joys, where he will quite literally come up and say, I'm mad, or I'm happy, or whatever feeling he happens to have. I can't imagine that happening in any environment, but in the home, learning that from his family. So my family has obviously been very influential on me this year. Hillary, can you tell me about someone who is especially influential to you this year? What made them influ influential? And what lessons they taught you? Well, thank you, Brett. Um, it's been my family too, but I've gone the other direction to the older generation. It's my 92 year old mom who, um, you know, as I hear the news and I hear how vulnerable people um, in their 80s and 90s have been and how many people have been lost, it's made me more and more thankful to have her in my life. And I'm very lucky for that. But when I was thinking about what I wanted to say about her, I was thinking about how, you know, she has a refrigerator magnet that says, you know, if life gives you lemon, make lemonade. And that's where I thought I was going. But then I realized, no, what she's really taught me this um, during this, this year is she's talked a lot about wants versus needs. Every time I hurt because another freedom is taken from her, she's like, well, it's a, it's a want. What do I actually need? And it turns out we don't need as much as we thought we did. So I think that that's what I will be thinking about as I go into my into my day, well, just through my daily life. Uh, my mom's still with me. She's 92, but she's more like 70 or 80. So she's with me for a very long time now. 
but I'll be thinking about her saying that as I go through my life and think about what is important to me and is this really something that I have to have? Um, I think we've learned a lot, all of us, about scaling down. So I thought about all the different ways she's done that, um, about having using the telephone because she doesn't have a computer to attend church services and to attend her choir. Um, she used to, she lived for her afternoon ping pong every Friday and she can't go out and play ping pong now. So she called a friend, had them find a secondhand exercise bike. She called my son, had him deliver it every day, hour, every morning. She is on that bike getting her exercise. She's probably gone half around the world by now. So yeah, I'm just, she's just taught me to be so appreciative and to really look at the value of my life. And I will always be thinking about, is it a want or is it a need? That's just something that I'm going to be hearing for the rest of my life, is my mom saying that to me. So, thanks for letting me talk about her. Um, Jonathan, did you experience any special moments of connection during this year of, of struggles? For me, the, the most connected I felt this year was when Lauren and I hung our pledges for the Black Lives Matter movement on the fence outside of South Church. And the morning before I did that, I participated in one of the protests through Portsmouth that actually started in Kittery. And given the distancing, I was in my car for it. But it was really interesting to arrive a bit late and see how long the line of cars was and all the signs everybody had hanging out of their windows. And it was really fun as well to pass by the various South Church members along the route and get away from them and, and see everybody um, participating in a different way, but the way that we often did. Um, and then when I was hanging our actual pledges on the fence was while the protest was going on in Market Square. And it made me feel like I was part of something bigger. And it was interesting to part of South Church, but also part of that larger movement and thinking about all the people that were there, many of whom I didn't recognize and as active as I am, it felt like they must be new to movements. So that was neat. And as I was turning to leave, a drone flew over and it made me think about the size of the crowd that was there and the size of the crowds that were all over the country that were greeting these moments. Um, and as I imagined that nationwide, all of us rising up for many months, I didn't feel quite so alone. So my hope is for all of us that as we move forward out of this year, that we find ways to find that power of connection and that we, we move forward with that sense of community. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we hold in our hearts until we are together again. Though death shattered us, we live our lives in love's embrace, even as we walk alone. Separated from our companions, bound at a deeper level, we walk different paths, yet find ourselves together. Here, now, be. Be who you truly are, be what circumstances require. Be always together, even as there is distance between us. Be where the rainbow ends. Why be? Because you are loved, and you are love, and some piece of the world longs for your love. Be love in the world, make peace, Seek understanding. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and days of old lang syne? For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll take a cup.
cup of kindness yet for days of old lang syne. Should twenty twenty come again and knock upon my door, I'll lock it tight and shout out, no, you can't come back no more. For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for days of old lang syne. Well, this year sure was memorable for many reasons why. Pandemic and election fears, we wish this year goodbye. For Lang Syne, my dear, for Lang Syne. We'll take a cup of kindness yet for days of old Lang Syne. For children born and love that's grown for blessings yours and mine. We thank the universe and sing for days of old Lang Syne. For old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne. Take a cup of kindness yet for days of old Lang Syne. This was a year of so much fear, but some was silver lined. Let's bring the hope and lessons learned to a future that is kind. For old Lang Syne, my dear, for old Lang Syne. We'll take a cup of kindness yet for days of old Lang Syne. <laughs>